I want to thank the choir and the praise team for also leading us into God's presence this morning. You guys did a wonderful job. I love, I love those songs. I love the words of those songs, especially those last two praise songs we sang. It's just a reminder, you know, such a great reminder that his love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on us. Sometimes I think we can get to that place where we feel like maybe, um, you know, we've, we've done too much or we've, you know, we've walked away from God for too long that somehow his love doesn't, um, doesn't, doesn't stay with us. But the promise is that there's nothing that we could ever do. There's no amount of distance that we could ever run away from him. Um, that his love wouldn't still remain there for us if we just turned back to him and, and ask him to forgive us. So it's good, a good word for us this morning. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go to Exodus chapter 3 for our primary text this morning, Exodus chapter 3. I'd like to read verses 1 through 12. It'll be on the screen for you if you don't have your Bibles with you as well. Exodus 3, 1 to 12. You know this story, but I'd like to share it with you again this morning. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry, uh, crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians, Egyptians are oppressing them, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have been brought the people up out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today I want to start a new sermon series with you called Lessons in Prayer from the Bible's Leading Characters. I wasn't certain where I was going to go with this next sermon series until this past Monday night. And about 10 minutes into the first presidential debate, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, it is time to talk about prayer with the people. We... Um, we need to be a people of prayer during this time, don't we? It's, um, it's challenging, and I, I thought that what we would do is for six weeks leading up to this election, we would just talk about prayer, and we would talk about what God wants from us, his people. And I want to hold before you one primary scripture. I shared with you this scripture from Exodus this morning because we're going to look at the character of Moses, and we're going to ask ourselves what we can learn about prayer from Moses. And over the next few weeks, we're going to look at David, and we're going to look at Mary, and we're going to look at Jesus and Paul and some of the other characters and ask ourselves, what can we learn about prayer from these characters? But there's one text that's going to flow through this entire sermon series, and it's 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. I'm sure you know this passage. It's one that I would love for you to commit to memory and be able to uh, recite when you need to remember it. It goes like this. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. This is an if-then promise from God. If you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, then I will, not I might, not I'll consider it, but I will hear from heaven, forgive your sins, and heal your land. And that's what we want, don't we? We want to be able to know that God is on the throne and that God is going to take care of the United States of America no matter who is in the White House come 2017, right? 
This is a divisive time, it's a confusing time, there's so many different feelings and emotions around this political uh, time, this presidential election, but for us as resurrection people, as people of God, we can trust and know that no matter who is in the White House, God remains on the throne, right? And that God promises us that he'll heal our land. So I want us to talk about prayer a little bit over the next few weeks because I don't know about you, um, I've, I've shared with you before, I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't become a Christian until I was a young adult, so I spent a lot of my young life just kind of learning uh, prayer uh, through different uh, types of prayers that my parents would teach me. They're, they were you know, wonderful people, Christian people. We just didn't go to church a lot, and I didn't know an awful lot about the Bible or about prayer. But my parents taught me when I was a little child to pray some of you might have prayed this prayer at night. Do you remember this one? Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, which, by the way, is a terrible prayer to teach your children, right? <laughs> yes, Mommy, I am now ready to go to sleep after I've just prayed if I should die before I wake. And I learned some other prayers as I got older. My parents taught me the Lord's Prayer. Um, we pray that prayer every Sunday here. You know that one, our Father. I learned somewhere along the line the serenity prayer. Do you know the serenity prayer? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. That's a great prayer. There's sorts, lots of variations on that prayer. I read one that said, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and good friends to bail me out when I completely lose it. <laughs> Some of you maybe grew up in a Catholic uh, home and you learned, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. We call that prayer the, the Hail Mary. But we're not gonna talk much about that today because I know there are Georgia fans in the house. Sorry, Garrett and Casey. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care who you are. That's funny. So we learn these rote prayers. We learn prayers that are something that we can learn to pray that way, and they're great. I think they're wonderful prayers. I, I have nothing against written prayers. I think they're fantastic, and they've helped shape my prayer life. When I became a young adult, though, I got saved in a Pentecostal church, in a charismatic church, and they taught me that I needed to have a prayer language that over and above just praying in English, there was another way to pray, that if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, then you pray in tongues in, the, the, in a different prayer language. And, and that, that shaped some of who, who I am uh, today as a Christian. And my Pentecostal brothers and sisters prayed with power and authority, and they, they, they prayed for healing and deliverance, and they taught me that when you pray with authority, that God responds to those prayers. And those are powerful ways of learning to pray. Now today, I've, all that has molded and shaped my prayer life, but what I've really come to the conclusion on is that prayer really, bottom line, basic foundation, is simply conversation or communication with God. It's something that we do because we have a relationship with God. If I didn't communicate with my wife, we wouldn't have a very good relationship, right? If I didn't communicate with my children, we wouldn't have a very good relationship. God desires for us to communicate with him. He desires for us to, to just talk with him. And there are a number of different ways to pray and, 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 and things that we can do when we pray, and we'll talk about all of that. But I just want right off the bat here for us to just say, prayer is a conversation with God. It's us being able to have communication with our Heavenly Father. Now, some people ask me why should I even pray, and I want to start by answering that question. Some people believe that if God knows everything and God's got it all figured out, should we even pray? Why should we pray? I think there are three good reasons why we should pray, and the first one is this, because Jesus said that we should pray. In Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon on the Mount, four times Jesus says, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. And then he ultimately says, so this then is how you should pray. So if Jesus tells me to do it, I'm pretty much just going to go with that, right? If Jesus prayed and Jesus tells me to pray, then I've got to believe that prayer is important. So Jesus tells me to pray. Secondly, I think the reason why we should pray is because there are several incidents in the Bible where prayer actually changes God's mind. 
where God actually does something different than what God had intended to do because somebody prayed. If you have your Bible, just look over to Exodus 32 and verse 14 with me real quick, just as one example. Exodus chapter 32, God is about to wipe out all the Israelites. He's pretty upset with them. And Moses prays for them and asks God to spare them. And in verse 14, it says, Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster that he had threatened. Some translations just simply say, then God changed his mind. There are times in, throughout Scripture, just like that one, where the prayers of the people move God's heart and he does something different. So I think it's important that we should pray. And then the last one is because it changes us. We're the ones who get changed when we pray. Um, we want to pray to move God's heart, but we also want to be pray, praying so that we can actually become better people. It's a spiritual discipline for us to pray. We become stronger in our faith. Now I want to give you five scientifically supported benefits of prayer. This is that wonderful moment where the preacher brings science into play here and says, hey look, science can actually help us as well. These wonderful scientists have studied prayer and I appreciate them taking people who pray and study their emotional patterns and their psychological behaviors and they've given us five scientifically supported benefits of prayer. Number one, sci uh, one, number one scientifically supported benefit of prayer is that it improves your self-control. How many people want that in their lives? We can be people who resist temptation more. We can resist the um, urge to have donuts and Coke for breakfast if we pray. Our, our self-control uh, becomes stronger. That's a wonderful thing. Number two, it makes you nicer. Now, who wouldn't want that? Some of you are glancing out of the corner of your eye at somebody sitting next to you saying, are you listening, are you listening? Some of us are just mean. We're just not happy people. And prayer sometimes just can help us to become nicer. It's a good thing to pray, to at least to improve our well-being. Number three is that prayer can make us more forgiving, more forgiving. And again, that's another, just something that we need to be better at. We struggle with forgiveness, and that's a whole other sermon, but you all know that when you don't forgive somebody, the person who suffers the most is you. It's not the person who hurt you. It's not the person that you can't forgive. It's us. When we harbor that and that, for, that unforgiveness just festers in us and it hurts us. So prayer helps us to become more forgiving. Prayer uh, increases our trust. It increases our trust in God because God responds to our prayers and we see God work and it increases our trust in others. When we come to pray together corporately, sometimes we reveal difficult things that we're going through or we become very transparent about something and we learn to trust other people as we pray with them and as they pray for us. And, and then the last thing is that prayer offsets the negative health effects of stress and who doesn't want that, right? Stress gets to us, we become anxious, ulcers develop, Prayer scientifically is shown to decrease the uh, effects of stress. The, the scriptures even teach this, right? Philippians chapter four, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer, with thanksgiving in your heart, make your request known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. All right, so very quickly, what can we learn from Moses? I think there are four things that we can learn from Moses that I want to share with you before we move to the communion table today about prayer. Moses teaches us, first and foremost, to pray our way. Moses prays in the wilderness to a burning bush. Sometimes people get all caught up in how should I pray? Should I kneel? Should I bow my head? Should I fold my hands? Do I need a prayer closet in my house to go to? All of those things are wonderful, but none of them are necessary. You can pray however you want to pray. And I think what we learned from Moses is outside in the wilderness talking to a bush that's on fire is a way to communicate with God. There are, you can pray anywhere, anywhere. And uh, I think this is helpful for us because many people feel like they've just, there's got to be in a church or, you know, as I said, your prayer closet or something like that. So I think it's important that we understand as Moses teaches us to pray our way. Secondly, he teaches us to pray honestly. Moses' communication with God is amazing when you read some of the things that he says uh, to, to God. Look at Numbers 
Uh, look at Numbers chapter uh, 11, um, if you've got your Bible with you. Numbers 11, 10 to 15, just a very quick um, picture of some of these very honest prayers of Moses. You, you know, Mo Moses' story is told to us through Exodus and Numbers specifically, so if you read these stories, you can get a real picture of who the, the person of Moses was. Verse um, 10 of, of Numbers 11 Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their tents, and the Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. That's an understatement. He asked the Lord, and this is now him talking to God, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to your ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, listen to what he says, please go ahead and kill me. This is an honest prayer from Moses, right? How can I do this? God, you asked me to do something impossible. These people that you've given me, they're whining and complaining, and what am I supposed to do? I, I, I think that Moses teaches us that it's, we, don't have to, we don't have to approach God with, um, with, with all this, this sort of reverence all the time, the sincere reverence in our prayers that sometimes if we're not feeling it, if we're feeling angry, if we're feeling frustrated, to just speak to God that way, hmm? to let him know how you feel. He knows how you feel anyhow. I think it's important for us to just be honest in our prayers with God. Third, pray consistently. Too many people pray once and then they leave it alone. And they say, well, God must not hear my prayers or God must not want to do this on my behalf. Pray consistently. Jesus teaches us this as well in the parable of the persistent widow. You remember that one in, in Luke? This persistent widow comes to this judge and keeps on, keeps on, keeps on asking for justice. And Jesus says that the judge finally goes, okay, I'm gonna give you justice because you're driving me crazy. He says, how much more will your heavenly father who loves you do what you need him to do if you pray consistently? Moses shows us this over and over and over through Exodus and Numbers. He's constantly praying for the people. He's constantly praying for God's strength. He's constantly praying that God would show his glory and his will to them. So pray consistently. And then the last one, and this may be uh, difficult for many of you, but it's so important, and that's to pray for others. And then I put in parentheses, especially the ones that you don't really want to pray for. Uh, again, what we see in uh, Exodus and Numbers is Moses praying for these people that God has given him who are driving him crazy. In fact, they actually at one point d d plan, uh, devise a plot to stone Moses to death, to kill him so that they can get out of here and get back to Egypt where they feel like they should go anyhow. And you see Moses praying to God on behalf of those people saying, Lord, please help them and help me to lead them and love them well. This is so important for us to pray for the people that we struggle with to pray for the people we don't understand or the, for the people we think are opposed to us. And it's not just the words of our mouth that are important, it's the things that we type, the things that we put on social media, the things that we send in emails. The Apostle James would tell us how incredibly important our words are. And when you put those words out there, the scriptures say that you can't bring those back. So I think we need to be very, very careful, especially in this day and age, right now in this heated political climate. I have so many friends that I see who, I don't think intentionally, but they post stuff on Facebook and they, they say things about the, the political party that they don't agree with or the presidential candidate they don't agree with in such vitriolic ways, hateful ways, hurtful ways. And I get the fact that we're divided on issues. I get the fact that we don't understand each other on some of this stuff, but I think the important point for us is to pray for them, to pray for each other, even when you don't feel like it. Again, what it does is it doesn't necessarily change them, it changes us. 
And it helps us to begin to get to a place where we can say, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't understand or agree with everything that those folks stand for or, 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 or think about. I don't understand what's going on in this country, but I'm going to pray and trust that God is going to do what God wants to do. And I pray and trust that God's going to change my heart and make me a more loving and caring and generous kind of person. So I think we learn all this stuff from Moses, some great, great examples of prayer from Moses. And I wanna pray now as we close and just ask God to let these words sink into our heart and to help us to hear what he wants to say to us today. I'm not sure which of those points or if any of them resonate with you, but perhaps God's saying something to you this morning. So let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord in prayer. God, we come this morning and we thank you for the opportunity to pray. We thank you for the opportunity to communicate with you that you're a God who really does want to have conversation with us. We thank you for Moses and his, uh, his example to us of how to pray. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to realize that we can pray in whatever way we desire to pray. We can pray wherever we are at we can pray sitting at our desk, we can pray in school, we can pray in Walmart, we can pray in our community, we can pray in the church, we can pray wherever we want. And that it's just a conversation with you, God, and you wanna hear from us. That we can pray honestly, that when we're struggling, Lord, we can say to you what's on our heart, and we can trust that you hear us and that you'll respond to us with grace that we can pray consistently, and I do pray that we would do that. Father, if there's something on our heart that we have been praying for and maybe we stopped, that we'll just keep on praying, knowing that sometimes your timing is not the timing that we desire, but it is your timing and that you're gonna do what you wanna do in your perfect timing, so help us to consistently pray. And then ultimately, Lord, let us pray for our enemies, as Jesus said to pray for our persecutors, to pray for those that we don't necessarily like or understand, to pray for those that are on the other side, whatever that might be. Help us to be people who pray, not to change them, but to change us. And I pray that you'll do that work in each one of our hearts, God, that we would be more loving and graceful people because of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to do this, and I pray now that as we come to your table for communion, that you allow us the opportunity to commune with you and to have a conversation with you during this time. Mostly, let our prayer in these moments be thank you. The attitude of gratitude that says, Lord, you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to be the sacrifice for us so that we might have life, we might have the opportunity and the privilege to pray. So let this be a holy moment for us as we come to the table today. Let's stand for benediction. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and thankful for the opportunity we've had to come to your table today to be reminded once again, as Jesus told us, to remember, to remember him, to remember the sacrifice that he's made on our behalf. Lord, help us to be people of prayer as we go today. Help us to have conversations with you this week and communicate with you this week in ways that you desire so that we can grow, so that we can become uh, more fully devoted followers of Jesus and we can become closer to you. Use us this week as we go into the places of business, into our schools, to our communities, our neighborhoods. Help us to be a light in a dark world. We love you, God, and we thank you and praise you. Send us forth now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. God bless you all. Go in peace. Oh.